Okay, Deborah, thank you for talking with me. Thanks, it's great to be here. And um, basically, we're here to talk about the concept of organism as something which is more general than just you and me bounded by our skins. And, and you're a great person to talk to about that because you study social insect colonies as a kind of a super organism. And so how would you describe, define the concept of organism in a way that's sufficiently general that it can encompass more than just what we obviously think of as organism? I guess the more we learn about biology, the more fuzzy the idea of organism becomes because we are learning that everything that we think of as an individual organism is actually composed of many different organisms. So it's very hard to say what an organism is. For an ant colony, we think about what reproduces. So an ant colony consists of uh, one or more reproductive females who lay the eggs, and then all the ants that are walking around are sterile female workers. But the ants can't make more ants. It takes a whole colony to make more colonies. So in that sense, the colony is a reproductive individual. And we can think of it as an organism in the sense that it makes more of its own kind. Right, right. And of course, also, it's a highly cooperative unit, right? Well, they all work together to function as a colony and to make more colonies. Yeah. Right, right. Um, although there is a, a concept of cheating, right? There is a sense in which natural selection takes place within a colony. Is that right, to a degree? Well, there have been a lot of different efforts to partition out the fitness or contributions of each component of a colony. Um, but it's very difficult to do because we don't really know how to measure how much each individual contributes and how much each individual gets. So it's very hard to take it apart because it's very difficult to parse out what an ant gives to the colony by going out to get food as opposed to what an ant gives to the colony by laying an egg. Well, now there's a mental component to the superorganism, which is something that you study a lot, right? So the concept of a group mind comes along with the concept of a of a, um, uh, a superorganism. So in what sense is, is mentality a, a group process in, a, in an ant colony? Well, we don't really see um, ant colonies, you know, writing books or doing differential calculus, but we can see that colonies function um, as a collection of different independent entities that work together. You could call that a mind. I mean, that's also how a brain works, but, um, whether an ant colony performs um, intellectual operations, I guess um, that would only be true if you define it in the barest uh, Turing sense that it can um, distinguish between states and make decisions. But we don't really see an ant colony as um, doing intellectual work. Well, foraging decisions, for example, the same kind of decisions that an individual organism makes with optimal foraging theory, for example, with an individual, is made by a social insect colony, right? But that the individual ants are playing a, a, a role in a distributed process, is that? That's right, so uh, a colony adjusts its effort to different tasks. So for example, it could change how much it's foraging in response to how much food is available, in response to what it costs to go out and get the food. Um, for example, the desert ants that I study have to manage a trade-off with water loss because they have to spend water um, because they lose water to evaporation, so they have to spend water to go outside and look for food. So you could say that the colony is making decisions about whether it's worth it today to go out and forage, given how much food there is out there and how dry it is. Now, would you call that um, the act of a mind? I don't know. I would. <laughs> you would? <laughs> so and one of the great things about your work is that you, you talk about this in, in basically in, in relation to um, the environment of a colony, and so a desert ant, such as your harvester ants, is uh, confronted with one set of trade-offs, as opposed to a tropical ant, for example, in a human environment and lots of competition. And so that requires, uh, they're, all, they're both distributed systems, but different kinds of distributed right. systems. So could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I think that the, well, ants are a good way to understand how collective behavior evolves in relation to the kinds of changing conditions that the system has to deal with. And so we can see by looking at ants that have evolved in the desert and ants that have evolved in the tropical forest, we can see that different kinds of collective behavior have evolved. And that there's some sort of feed forward systems, as I think you put it, that you know, in, in the case of the uh, harvester ants, something good has to happen before 
before they go out, and in the case of the tropical ants, something bad has to happen for them to, to go in. Could you elaborate on, on that a little bit? Well, all ants, all ant colonies, like all collective systems, operate using very local interactions that in the aggregate create the behavior of the whole system. And for uh, the desert ants, those interactions generate positive feedback. That is, uh, foragers don't go out to forage unless they have enough contact with returning foragers with food. So the more food there is out there, the faster they find it, the faster they come back, and the more ants go out. So that's positive feedback. And the outcome of that for the system is that they don't go out unless it's worthwhile. So it sets the default to not go out unless something good is happening. In the tropical forest, I study another kind of ant. Those are uh, turtle ants. They live in the canopy. Um, they make these elaborate trail networks in the canopy. And they use a different kind of system that basically just keeps going unless something bad happens. So you could call that negative feedback. If a competing species shows up, if there's a rupture, if something happens to stop it, then they will slow down until they can repair it and fix it. But otherwise, the default is just to keep going. That's so great. And, uh, and so I know that you've written on, on ties with basically human technology. Uh, you, you call the ants the internet. And so what is the connection between the kind of distributed process in which each agent is, is responding to its local environment? Well, actually, you've written quite broadly on this. So you know, cancer and, and uh, the immune system and all of these are systems in which the agents are are with the system as a whole is adaptive, but the agents are responding only to their given locality. So, what's the applications for the internet? What's uh, how does the how does the internet inform the internet? Well, the uh, system that the harvester ants use is analogous to the system that's used in the internet. There's a protocol called TCP, which regulates how much data goes out in relation to the amount of available bandwidth. So, it also uses positive feedback. So when you press the button to send your email message, the data goes out in packets. And each packet doesn't go out unless it's received an acknowledgment that the previous packet had the bandwidth to go on. So the more bandwidth there is, the more um, likely the, the system is to be reinforced to send out more. So it's positive feedback. So um, I worked on a model of the system in Harvester Ants with Balaji Prabhakar, who's a computer scientist, who noticed this analogy between how that protocol on the internet works and how these ants are regulating their foraging activity. So that's the connection that um, he called the, we called the internet. So you've, you've um, actually studied a large number of ant colonies, even so that you could actually look at natural selection in action, right? That during a drought yeah. of the many colonies that you're monitoring, and you actually see some surviving, some, and so on. Could you elaborate on, on your studies at that scale? Yeah, I've been tracking the same population of colonies since I was a grad student. And um, so there are about 300 colonies a year. Um, and I've just counted it all up. So I've tracked um, 1,057 colonies over this time, over, <laughs> over 30 years. And not all of the original ones are still with us. Um, so by tracking the same colonies year after year, I found out how long they live. They live for 20 to 30 years. And the, the, the average colony does? Yes. Okay. So a colony is founded by a single queen, and she has one mating session in the first few weeks of her life. And she stores the sperm, um, digs a hole, starts a colony, and she goes on producing all of the ants and all of the reproductives year after year until eventually when she dies, there's nobody to make more ants. And there's then no the colony replacement dies. queens or anything That's right. Like that. They don't adopt another queen. Wow. So during the time that we've been studying this population, um, things have changed. So the first, from um, 1988 to, uh, sorry, from 1988 to about the year 2000 was a very wet period. And from 2003 on, there's been a drought. And in fact, there's another study looking at tree rings who, um, suggesting that that period, the two periods of this study um, were first the wettest period in, this, in the Southwest in the last thousand years or so, and then the driest. And it looks like the dry um, side is going to win out. I mean, it looks like it's just going to get hotter and drier. And so we've seen very different relations among colonies and how they compete for foraging area and how this uh, foraging behavior um, regulated in response to humidity 
the consequences for the colony are quite different when it's dry. So the ants don't go out unless they have a high enough rate of ants coming in with food. Um, and they tend not to go out when it's really dry. But colonies are different. So some colonies are more likely to reduce foraging when it's dry. So they sacrifice getting food in order to conserve water. And what we found is that in the midst of the drought, those colonies are the ones that are more likely to have offspring colonies. So um, apparently they can store food enough to survive, but losing water is worse. And they do better if they actually give up getting food in order to save water. And so we will continue to see if that strategy, that particular way of regulating foraging is more effective as the drought continues. Wow, and so um, is, there, is there a sense in which, is there some plasticity in a single colony in terms of capable of changing their strategies, what you would call some colony level of learning? Uh, I don't see any evidence that ants learn. Um, there's plasticity in the sense that the process itself is stochastic. So no ant is deciding, okay, this is a day when we're gonna save water. But in the aggregate, all those ant by ant decisions about how much stimulation they need in order to be willing to go out, those add up to the activity of the colony. And we've been looking actually at differences among individual ants. So we marked ants with colored paint so we could tell one ant from another. And we looked to see whether within a colony there were some ants who were just more reluctant to go out when it was dry. And if that were true, then you could see how the differences among colonies would be a result of the distribution of certain types of ants. So one colony that had more wimpy ants who just refused to go out when it's dry would end up foraging less, whereas a colony that had fewer of those would end up foraging more. But in fact, we didn't find that. We didn't find differences among ants within a colony. So everybody in one colony is equally likely to reduce foraging at a certain um, humidity level, whereas everybody in another colony seems to be different. So the differences among colonies aren't due to the um, components, to the distribution of certain types. Um, and actually, um, there's a long history in how we think about social insects of imagining that the behavior of the colony is a consequence of the distribution of certain types, that you have so, so many ants who are like this and so many ants who are like that, and that what evolution would be shaping would be that distribution. Right, and, there's, and that's part of your difference between your view of, of ant colonies and, and uh, Ed Wilson and Bert Holdover, as yes, I understand. Yes, yes. So in, with respect to this particular decision about how they manage foraging in response to humidity, we don't find that colonies differ in the distribution of certain types, but that Everybody in one colony is different from everybody in another. And we're learning that it has something to do with the, uh, the neurophysiology of dopamine. So we have found that when we um, give ants dopamine, they're more likely to forage, but the ones in the colonies that reduce foraging more respond more to dopamine. So it seems as though, um, and there's another component that we find that colonies differ in just how much they lose water so maybe differences in the particular um, configuration of their exoskeleton or something about their anatomy or something makes some colonies a little bit more likely to lose water. So those are the ones that reduce foraging when it's dry. So they feel a little thirstier or something when they come back from a foraging trip and it's been really hot outside. They're just a little bit more reluctant to go out. But those are more responsive to dopamine. So it seems that dopamine overrides the ant's reluctance to go out when it's dry. Okay. So the differences among colonies may be due to differences among colonies in some small um, uh, modulation of the dopamine system that lead to these differences in how individuals well, make that, decisions. That leads to my next uh, question, yeah. which is a little bit hard to articulate, but yep. you know, so often, especially inclusive fitness theory, explains variation among colonies as due to genetic relatedness. Yes. And but when you think of a colony as a complex system, as you do, then it's quite possible that a very small change in a complex system uh, can create a large systemic level effect. It, it yes. basically leads to a whole new view of variation. 
in which genetic relatedness, high genetic relatedness, is, is not uh, perhaps uh, necessary. Right. And so, uh, so if, if you could just elaborate on that, I'd, I'd love to hear your views on, on that. Uh, nothing about what we understand about the system um, implicates any role for genetic relatedness in how it works. <laughs> okay, there's a bold statement. Yeah, I mean, it's not as though the ants are calculating you know, how much they ought to forage given how much food one of their um, true sisters is going to get rather than one of their half-sisters. Um, so I, I think that that um, idea, um, well, as you know, it all began with um, Hamilton's uh, beautiful insight about the consequences of relatedness for um, how a, a, a worker would be more related to her sisters than she would be to her own daughters. Right. Yeah. But in that very um, beautiful story, the queen made it only once, and uh -huh. we find that in fact, in particular in this system, we know that the queen has to mate many times because there are two different lineages that have to mix. So um, there don't seem to be many ant colonies out there that um, follow um, Hamilton's idea. And, and also there are some colonies with multiple queens, right? Yes, there are some colonies with multiple queens, and um, uh, there's, it seems to be quite um, common that ant queens mate many times. So the sisters are not, the workers are not more related to their sisters than they would be to their own offspring. Right, right. So um, that's, that was the origin of this notion that um, tuning genetic relatedness would somehow tune the relations among ants and drive how the colony works. Right. And um, I think it's a great idea, it just doesn't seem to apply to ants. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, one of Tehard's uh, concepts was that a superorganism uh, might consist of a brain of brains, that the, that the lower level unit mm -hmm. in some respects is, has this you know, neuron-like status, but in other respects might be quite a sophisticated decision-making unit in its own right. And I know from honeybees, but that's certainly the case that the scout bees, for example, when they're evaluating a, a cavity based on Tom Seeley's work, they're making as individuals quite nuanced decisions about the quality, multi-dimensional decisions about the quality of the, of the cavity, and then they go back and then, and then they vote in a social process. Is it also the case that an individual ant is uh, in some ways just has a neuron-like uh, status, but in other ways it could be a brain in its own right? Well, ants do have brains in their own right. I mean, so yeah. function as some kind of, you know, um, uh, yeah, uh, unit. the ants do function as autonomous decision-making units, and in the aggregate, that creates the decisions of the colony. And um, I have found over time that it seems to me to be less and less useful to try to t take those apart um, because. Um, you can't really explain anything that the ant is doing except in the context of the colony, but the colony is no more than a bunch of ants. And so I think that uh, we can go around in circles um, trying to parse out which part is the individual and which part is the colony when um, those abstractions don't really apply to what's happening, because what's happening is ants are doing things and they interact with each other, and we call the whole thing a colony. Right. So the colony is truly the unit of selection for, in most respects. Yes. Yeah. Right. The final question, uh, Deborah, is uh, I'm sure you're asked all the time, you know, what's the relevance of this great ant work for, uh, for human complex systems? And, and uh, how do you answer that, uh, that uh, question? You already have to a degree, but uh, so what's the... What, what's the, the the, the relevance of this of studying this kind of superorganism, the, 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 the ant superorganism, for human social cooperation and so on? Well, I'll go back to where we started, that um, because of the incredible diversity of ants and what we can learn from them about how collective behavior evolves in very different conditions, maybe we can see general patterns that we could see also in human systems and in other systems, like uh, cellular systems, you know, smaller and, um, and, I don't know if humans are bigger, but more towards human and more towards things we think of as, as more like cells, like uh, bacteria and um, even cellular systems. 
So um, I don't think that people behave like ants or um, that people ought to try to emulate the ants or anything like that, but I think that maybe we can learn from looking at the diversity of collective behavior about different possibilities for how collectives can operate and respond to changing conditions. Awesome.